John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is where we are, and we are going to start the final segment of our journey through the Gospel of John. We mentioned even this past Wednesday, and we've mentioned it several times throughout this whole series, that John has actually uh, waited a long time, almost till he was at the end of his life, to write out his gospel account. I think he had read Matthew and Mark and Luke, and he had preached the message of Jesus over and over and over again, and he had his own unique components of the story that were true but had not been written down. And he, at the end of his life, God called him by the Spirit to write down uh, these, these accounts or these uh, different stories about Jesus, these different things that Jesus said and did in such a way that we are left in the Gospel of John with a very unique account in terms of its comparison to the other three. Close to 60% of the Gospel of John is material not found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so when we look at the Gospel of John, we see a very, uh, a very helpful rhetorical device in his outline because he has three sets of seven, and we talked about that. He's got, uh, he's got seven uh, he's got seven witnesses. We looked through those witnesses, people like Nicodemus and the woman at the well and, and, um, and others. Uh, these witnesses testify about what Jesus, who Jesus is. And then we also have the seven signs or seven miracles, you might call them. We like the word signs because a sign is something that points to something else. And you can mistake a miracle for just being an event that was meant to stand alone, but you can't, you can't look at a sign and not connect the dots with what it's pointing to. And so these seven signs, like the water turning into wine and the raising of Lazarus from the dead and, and, uh, and the feeding of the multitude, we looked at all of these signs, and these signs testified to what Jesus could do. But John said, you know, there's just something else missing from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, something that I can't go, uh, go from this life without recording, and that's these seven I am sayings of Jesus. Now, the witnesses were other people who told us about Jesus. The signs were events that testified to a specific part of who Jesus was. But now, when we look at these seven I am sayings, we're looking at words from Jesus' own mouth about who he is, and about what he does, and about how he, in, in, the, in, the, in the most complete way possible, meets the desires of the human heart. He meets the desires of the human heart. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to study through Jesus' words about himself. And these encounters are prompted by events and circumstances that do reflect our deepest desires. C.S. Lewis once said, uh, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. I mean, think about it for just a moment. We, we live in a broken world, yes, but still very much of who we are and the core desires that we have reflect the good design of God in, in the world. And so when we look within us, what C.S. Lewis is saying, when we look within ourselves and we see a desire that no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. He says, if none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, then that does not prove the universe is a fraud. Probably, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it to suggest the real thing. And so, in coming here this morning, it's helpful to ask, what do you want? Like, what do you really want? You say, well, Ryan, I'm, I'm here right now. I, I'm, maybe you want food. Uh, or uh, you could say, I could use a cup of coffee right now or uh, a nap. You know, uh, all of those may be valid answers. But I'm talking about what, what, do you, what are you in the deepest part of who you are? What do you really want? And you say, well, I don't know. I, say, I would say, well, look at the past six weeks of your life and what has excited you? What has driven you? What has caused you to sacrifice? All of these things reflect what we have chosen for ourselves to pursue. That's what we really want. And so one of the spiritual axioms that I've, I've learned very early on, and it's, it's kind of hit me in the face over and over again in my Christian life, is that where I am with the Lord is right where I want to be. That I never have less of the Lord because He's withholding something from me. I have, some, I have all of the Lord right now that I want. 
And so for us, as we come into this place together, and as we begin in these seven I am sayings, I want you to be asking yourself that question. In my life, the testimony in my life, what does it show me that I truly want and that I truly desire? It may seem too simple, but I would admonish you this morning to want what God has provided. And we'll, we'll actually use this uh, a little bit later on in the service. But in my house, we have a saying when it comes to the dinner table. Now, my wife is an incredible cook, and uh, even when she messes things up, it tastes immaculate. I'm, and I'm serious about that. I could give you examples of where she messed something up, and it turned out amazing. But whatever's put in front of my daughters, you can always guarantee that if I ask them, girls, what do we say about the food that's put in front of us? You get what you get, and you don't pitch your fit right? And so in the same way today, I'm telling you, God's provided something very precious for you. And it would be in your best interest this morning to look at your heart and say, do I really want it? Because if you want what God has already provided, then you will find yourself in a place that no other person in this world will find themselves apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a place of contentment and a place of peace. And so want what God has provided. And these I am sayings will give you clarity about God the Father, about Jesus the Son, and about the desires that the Spirit is seeking to satisfy within you through the truth. And our entire goal throughout all of this has been John chapter 20, verse 31. And John writes, the entire purpose of all, all that he has written is so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. We want to find life in here today, and we want to set out on this last part of our journey this morning and truly find that Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. But before we dig into that specific part, we need to recognize something about these I am sayings. Each of these I am sayings would have elicited a certain response from Jesus' Jewish listeners, because Jesus is saying unequivocally that He is God Himself. Jesus is not skirting the issue with his Jewish audience. When he says, I am, and then he adds a metaphor to the end of it, his Jewish listeners immediately pick up on the fact that he is connecting himself with the God of the Old Testament. And you say, well, how is that? Well, let's go all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, and you can kind of just journey with, uh, with me there mentally, because we'll kind of do a brief overview. Exodus chapter 3, the very beginning of the book of Exodus, the people of Israel are enslaved in Egypt, and they have been so for 400 years. Now, God was calling Moses to be his vessel of deliverance for the Hebrew people. And one of the things about God is that when he uh, wants to invite people to join him in his work, he reveals his character to them. When God wants to invite you to join him in his work, he reveals his character to you. And for Moses, it was through something we know as the burning bush, right? The bush that was on fire but not consumed. And so Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, let me read it. And as I read, you just kind of listen. It says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Moses rightly asked God, What shall I say to them? And God spoke again to Moses, and He said, I am who I am. And He said, say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now God revealed something to Moses that day. It was His personal or covenant name. This name, which in uh, Hebrew, uh, or in the, the Hebrew scholars, is called the Tetragrammatron, which, don't be intimidated by that, that's just a a big word that simply means four-letter word. Because the, 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 the personal name of God, Y-H-W-H in Hebrew, is the, the four-letter word that the Hebrew people would not say casually. You know, when God talks about, about uh, taking His name in vain, I mean just throwing it around casually. It doesn't necessarily just talk about uh, talk about the, the, the curse word that people have associated with, with the name of God, but we're actually talking about just, just treating His name and His character casually is what that commandment talks about. He's talking about that covenant name of God. And so this played itself out in the 39 books of the Old Testament because that name is used over 6,500 times in those 39 books of the Old Testament. 
It was so sacred, the Jews wouldn't even add vowels to the word. Because in Hebrew, all you have when you look at the page and you read from right to left is the consonants. And then the Masoretes, they came over, came, came around a, a little bit later on, and they would add these dots to indicate where the vowels were. And so we know that the covenant name of God is Yahweh. Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, and we add the vowels in there, Yahweh. Now, just this is a total side note, not on my notes, but if you have some folks knock on your door and they tell you that you can't trust your Bible and you can't trust the, uh, the church that you're in, these people are known as Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, if, if you, if you uh, are in conversation with them and they say, well, the, the way we know your church is not the real church and the way that we know your Bible has been altered is because they've taken the name of God out of there. And they'll say, see, our Bible here, it has Jehovah, but your Bible, it has Lord, right? Which is the, is the uh, lowercase or small caps, uh, Lord. They say, see, that proves that your Bible's been altered. You can look at them and you can say, well, they did that because they respected the name of God so much. And see, you don't even have the name of God right, Jehovah's Witnesses, because there's no, there's no V in the Hebrew language. There's also no J in the Hebrew language. That's actually the German form of what? Of Yahweh. When the German scholars later came and, and, and translated it, and then they, they took that and applied it to the King James Bible, right? They came up with Jehovah, right? Now, I don't, I don't think that using the name Jehovah is wrong, but I also wouldn't say that the people who love the name of God so much in Scripture, not to just not to put it all over the place so that people would throw it around, I wouldn't accuse them of playing fast and loose with the name of God either. And so, total side note, but since you probably will have people who knock on your door one day that would try to throw that at you, I want you to be prepared for how to answer that. They loved it. They revered the name so much. They didn't want to just use it casually, and so they replaced it with Adonai or Lord. Now, the Hebrew sages saw the name of God in these, uh, in these consonants, these three consonants, because Y-H-W-H, H is used twice. They saw something very special. They saw three separate verbs. And these are fun to say, so let's say these together. Under W, or after W, you have the word hove. Everybody say hove. It's just fun to say, right? That's the Hebrew verb for I was. And then you have the H. This was really fun to say. Just pretend like you're, you're uh, a kid and you're doing karate. You say haya, right? Hi-ya. Yeah, there you go. That's the, that's the Hebrew verb for I am. And then you have the Y, which is uh, just pretend like you're riding a horse and say yee ya. That one's fun. It's I will be. And so every time the name of God is used, it's a testimony to the eternality of this God that has just revealed himself to you. It's a testimony that He is so far beyond us, that He has encountered us in time where He is, so that we can connect with He who is out of time, with He who is eternal, with He who is immutable and unchangeable. We're we're, we're being invited to know Him. This personal covenant name of God is an invitation for us to know Him and to trust Him in our limitation, because He has none. And so every time the Hebrew people would would fix their eyes on this four-letter word, this this personal covenant name of God, they recognized that He was revealing Himself to people who were made to know Him. He is revealing Himself as eternal and unchanging, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so that's why it's significant that when Jesus takes this, this name, I am, and he ascribes it to himself and then adds a metaphor, Jesus is doing something that nobody else in Old Testament history had ever done. Jesus is taking the name of God and he is advancing it and bringing more clarity in a way that we can understand. And that's exactly what Jesus set out to do. Hebrews chapter 1, uh, flip that slide for me. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the writer of the Hebrews says, Long ago... At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. This writer of the Hebrews, who is most likely a Hebrew himself, he's saying, listen, my Hebrew people, 
we've had the 39 books of the Old Testament. We've had the law. We've had the prophets. We've had the covenants. We've had all of the forefathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But no one gets us close to understanding God the way that Jesus does. You've heard all of this explanation about who Jesus or about who God is from the 39 books of the Old Testament, but Jesus is coming and he is advancing our knowledge. He is revealing God in a way that is more clear than we've ever heard before. And so fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. That's what the writer of the Hebrews is saying. And so it's very significant that today we begin with Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. That is, He spiritually satisfies and eternally secures all who believe in Him. The, the significance, and I'm telling you, this is kind of the sermon in a nutshell, I'm telling you this. The significance of Jesus saying that I am the bread of life means two things. That He eternally satisfies and that He eternally secures all who trust in Him. Because Jesus is God's faithful provision. So in John chapter 6, just re-familiarize yourself with the context, Jesus has, he has just fed the multitude the day before. Now you remember the multitude was not just 5,000, it was 5,000 men, so more than likely it was between 15 and 25,000, depending on the number of wives and children uh, in, the, in the crowd. So Jesus had just fed this large multitude of people, and it's right before, you don't, we didn't talk about this last time, this is right before on the Jewish calendar a festival called the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. In fact, if you look at the subheading uh, of, of John chapter 7, it says, Jesus at the Feast of Booths. And so all of the Jewish people in the audience know that this festival is coming up. And they know that Jesus has just fed them this, out of these five loaves and two fishes. And then, if you remember, Jesus and his disciples, they disappeared. Jesus went on a mountain to pray. The disciples uh, got in a boat to go to the other side of the Sea of Tiberias. And the people who had eaten that day of the five loaves and two fishes and seen God multiply the food, those people had gotten in boats and they were trying to seek out where Jesus was. They were trying to find him. And you think, well, it's good that they're seeking Jesus, right? Well, look at verse 26. John chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus, they, they come to him. They said, Rabbi, did you, did you come, when did you come here? In verse 26, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. He's saying, you didn't come to me because I'm the rabbi, I'm the teacher. You came to me because your physical hunger is telling you that you need another meal. You came to me because your bellies are growling all over again. And Jesus says that's not the right motive, but they engage in this conversation, and as best as I can tell, there are six or seven interactions here between Jesus and the crowd. But skip down to verse 31 and see the fact that this Feast of Booths was coming up. Verse 31, Jesus says, our, they, they mentioned, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So this is on the mind of the people that Jesus is speaking to. This Feast of Booths. Because that's what the Feast of Booths pointed back to. It points back to the time where God, uh, when His people were wandering in the wilderness, there after they had been delivered from Egypt, as they're wandering in the wilderness, Exodus chapter 16 Jesus, I mean, uh, God the Father tells Moses, Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, tells Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And so we called, or they called this manna, bread from heaven, in Exodus chapter 16. And the Feast of Booths was meant to take the people of Israel back to that time so they could identify and remember the faithfulness of God that for 40 years, every day, bread would come from heaven. And you remember the cool thing about manna was they were called to collect how much? Just, just that portion for the day, right? If you use the little devotionals, daily bread, this is, this is one, of the, one of the places that that name comes from. Right? And so they would go out and they'd pick up uh, just that day's portion of manna. But if they tried to, to, to 
get too much, what would happen if they tried to keep it overnight? Yeah, it would spoil, and yeah, it would grow maggots. It was just disgusting, right? And so, however, I don't know why, just because God's amazing, and He wanted to testify to them about this seven-day, uh, you know, six days of creation, seventh-day rest, uh, on the Friday night, because their Sabbath was on Saturday, on their Friday night, they could gather two days, right? And it wouldn't get maggots. I don't, that's just, that's just God. God, He's Lord, right? So, so that's what He did. But for 40 years, morning after morning after morning after morning, it's a testimony. I'm watching after you. Even though you've been faithless, I'm watching after you. Even though you've doubted me, I'm watching after you. Even though you complained about the manna that you picked up yesterday morning, guess what? I'm going to still provide it the next day. You see, there's something beautiful in Exodus chapter 16 and in that provision of the manna that, that God wanted His people to remember. It's that God's character and His faithfulness do, do not depend upon the character and faithfulness of His people. God's not broken like we are. God doesn't keep short accounts like we do. Like he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not quick-tempered like we are. He's, 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 he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so when, when these people are encountering Jesus and they know this feast is about to come up, Jesus engages them and tells them something very specific. That they've missed the point on the manna. Look at verse 32. Verse 32, Jesus then said, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God, the bread of God, is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so Moses didn't give the people of Israel the manna, God did. And in the same way, God has sent the true bread from heaven. And look at verse 34. They respond the exact same way the woman at the well did. You remember when Jesus said that he was going to put within us a fountain of living water? Uh, the lady at the well mistook this as a physical water, a physical thirst quencher. And she said, give me this water always. Well, Jesus says that the bread of, he- bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, give us this bread always. They're not talking about Him. They're not talking about the spiritual nourishment and satisfaction that Jesus can bring. They're talking about physical bread. They're saying, oh, you've got like an endless buffet somewhere. We, we would like that very much. Please and thank you. You know, that's basically what they're saying. And Jesus says, you guys still aren't getting it. In verse 35, He says it as plainly as He can. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, that, that second part of that phrase, after I am the bread of life, the, it's basically Jesus saying the same thing two different ways. To come to him is the same as, as believing in him. And to never hunger is the same thing as never thirsting. Jesus satisfies spiritual hunger like no other. And here's just a tidbit. Here's just a tidbit. Where was Jesus born? Where was that? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Who knows the literal translation of the word Bethlehem? House of bread. So here's this little boy who's grown up now to be this man who was born in the house of bread who's coming now to say that He is the true bread of heaven, the bread of life that has come down to spiritually satisfy all of the people who would believe in Him. Now, isn't God good? There's just just little, little diamonds everywhere you look in Scripture that Jesus was born at the house of bread because He is the one who satisfies spiritual hunger like no other. There was an old saint named Simon Tugwell. He said, It is the desire for God which is the most fundamental appetite of all. And it is an appetite we can never eliminate. We may seek to disown it, but it will not go away. If we deny that it is there, we shall in fact only divert it to some other object or range of objects. And that will mean that we invest some creature or creatures with the full burden of our need for God, a burden which no creature can carry. You know what that's saying? It's saying that you have an appetite within you, a God-shaped hole, if you will, that can only be satisfied 
in a relationship with God Himself. It is a, it is a, it is a pit, it is a hole inside of you that will devour anything else you try to put into it. We can trace every problem with humanity back to this one concept. Why does addiction exist? Why do people abuse alcohol? Why do people become codependent in relationships? Why, why, are, why are kids leaving the church? Why are parents confused about being the primary disciples of their children? Why, why, do, why are husbands and wives struggling, even in the church, to find, to find a, a foundation of solid relationship in their marriage? Why as a society are, are, we, are we virtuous people kind of wandering around in this moral fog? It's really a moral chaos. Why, why do these things exist? It, it, it all goes back to, in some measure, it all goes back to the fact that we are trying to put other things in that place that only God can fill. No, nothing else can fill that void. Nothing else can fill the void that God alone was, has created within us to fill for Himself. And He's saying, I've given you the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And yet, and yet, people within the church and people outside of the church still continue to gobble up their children, their families, their possessions, money, work, you name it, and throw it into that pit. And guess what? It destroys the worshiper and the object of worship. God is the only thing that you can worship and it not destroy both you and Him at the same time. If you try to put your kids in the place of God, you will destroy your children. If you try to put your work in the place of God, you will destroy your work and your work will destroy you. If you even if you try to put the most precious relationship that God has given you on this earth, your spouse, if you try to put your spouse in the place of God, then you will destroy your spouse and yourself and your marriage in the process. Mandy knows <laughs> that there's one person that I love more than her. And I know that there's one person that she loves more than me, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's the only way that things work. <laughs> you know, that, that's the only way that things work. That's the only way that work can have its rightful place in my life. That's the only way that my kids can have my, their, their rightful place in my life. It's when I refuse to put anything else in that void except for God. But when I commit to follow Jesus and taste of Him as the bread of life, to believe in Him, to come to Him, that's what, that's what tasting is, to, to believe in Him and come to Him and to fix my eyes on His truth and to saturate my heart and my mind, then work is work and it's great. And in marriage, while it's got its struggles, the foundation is settled. And while my kids know that I love them and that they are an earthly treasure in my life, that there is someone still more important. Their mom, and then there's somebody else. <laughs> thought I was, she thought I was going to forget that one. And, but then someone else, I mean, th this is the way that life was meant to be ordered. And let me tell you, I, I, have, no, I have no doubt I have no doubt, I want to say this very clearly, that this, this room right now, because I'm not preaching to people out there, okay? I'm, I'm preaching to you. This room is filled with people who are trying to fill something else with a void that only God himself was made to fill. And, and, and listen, I'm not condemning you for it because I'm struggling with it just like you are. I'm having to fight that fight every day, just like you are. I'm telling you to consider, what do you really want? Because Jesus can satisfy spiritual hunger like no other. Not even, not even spirituality. God doesn't want spirituality in your life. And when I say spirituality, I mean, I mean just being a spiritual person. I, and I've got several of my notes, but let me just give you this one. We live in a social media age where, where people want to go viral. Fame and recognition is, is what people seek, and it's always been that way. People want popularity, but listen to a voice of one who has now met her maker. Princess Leia herself, Carrie Fisher, gave one of the most phenomenal quotes against this social media culture before social media was ever invented. You know what she said? She learned this when she was very young. 
and, and fame destroyed her life. She said, celebrity is obscurity in waiting. Celebrity is obscurity in waiting. You know what that means? People are going to forget what you've done. Guess what? In a hundred years, every single one of us will be dead. Right? All of the trophies will be in a landfill somewhere. All of the money will be in somebody else's pocket. Right? All the cars will be broke down. Your business probably won't be there. And who knows, and I know this isn't, we, we, we struggle with this, but it's, it's a reality check for us. I pray America's still around, but it may not be. There is, there is one thing that is eternal, and that is the Word of God and the souls of men. And so, for us, we just got to keep these things in order of importance. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I am the bread of life. Not just, not just a physical bread that you consume and you're okay. I'm a spiritual bread because man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus, the word, is saying, I am the bread of life. Taste and see that I am good. Come to me and never hunger. Believe in me and never thirst. And in doing that, he is identifying himself with the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 51, the Messiah says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligent, diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast and sure love given to you. You say, what does it cost to buy this bread? Nothing. Nothing. Jesus just says, come. It's here. Believe, and you will find it. You see, Jesus is the only one that can satisfy spiritual hunger like no other. But Jesus offers this continual satisfaction as we pursue a specific work. Look at verse 29 before you throw stones at me, okay? Because Jesus is speaking the language that He knows human beings need to hear. You've grown up in an environment where you are the measure or you're the sum of your achievements. And so are the people that Jesus is talking to in John chapter 6. And they say, okay, you're telling me we need to work for this bread? Show us, and we'll do anything for it. We'll work for it. Verse 29, Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, the only one that matters. The only one that you can do that you believe. You see, faith or belief, trust, I've heard one, one old pastor say that it's the anti-work, right? It's the anti-work, meaning that you're not working on your own, you're putting your faith in the work of another. And so Jesus says, if you want this bread that continually satisfies, then believe in me. Jesus offers continual satisfaction as we pursue the work of belief. But, but next, Jesus brings eternal security. I'm going to read these verses, and I want you, I, I want you to, to maybe put an asterisk beside these and come back and read them later. Because there's a lot of controversy that goes on in evangelical life with what's called the doctrines of grace or Reformed theology or Calvinism and Arminianism. And can I just tell you, I find absolutely no use in those. I just don't. I, I don't find use in the, the arguments about them. I think, I think every person has to be, has to be convinced from, in, in his own mind, from his own study of Scripture. And so I just, want, I just want you to come back and read these verses. I don't want you to do it, though, to reinforce some kind of doctrinal position. I want it to lead you to worship. Because theology without doxology is not truly embraced. That means you can't learn something about Jesus and not leave worshiping. If you don't worship, it shows you had not really grasped it yet. And so grasp these verses and let it, let it land on you and let it lead you to worship. Jesus says, All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose nothing, 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 
of all that He has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus alone brings eternal security. You cannot find eternal security outside of an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. Do you know why? Because He does the will of His Father, and it is the will of His Father that He keep those who would believe in Him. You are in His grip. Remember what I said about the Old Testament? The character of God does not depend on the character of God's people. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. That's the only way I'm still in the faith. Because Jesus is keeping me. He is keeping me. He, I am in His grip. Now that doesn't, that, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that when I made my profession of faith at 10 years old to be baptized, and this is just Ryan speaking from my own personal understanding of, of where I was in that day, I had no idea what the gospel was. I had no idea what sin was. I had not grasped it, but I wanted to be baptized. That does not believe that if I had, that if I had died between the, the ages of 10 and 17, which I almost did a couple of times, that I wouldn't have busted hell wide open. That 10-year-old profession was meaningless. It was meaningless. Because I didn't know Jesus. I, I had not been transformed by His grace. And trust me, I needed to be at 10 years old. But when I put my faith and my trust in Him, when I was 16, about to be 17 years old, there was a, there was a covenant security that washed over my soul where I knew that I was His and He was mine that I was in his grip. And can I tell you, friend, if you don't have that security today, you can't find it anywhere else. You can't find it anywhere else. Don't, don't, base, don't base your eternal security on a past profession that was meaningless in your life to this day. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that that past profession was not a real relationship with Jesus. But it's the relationship with Jesus that began when I was 16, about to be 17, that, that continues up to this day. That's a testimony of whether or not I'm really His, and He is mine. And so, just because that's a really heavy point, and I want you to hear a little bit and think about that for a second. I'm going to tell you a story. There was a young woman, maybe this could be the Johnson family one day, but there was a young woman who brought home her fiancé to meet her parents. Now, hopefully, girls, that's, that's not acceptable. They better uh, talk to me before they become your fiancé. But anyway... They were around, uh, sitting around dinner, and the mother looked at the father and said, hey, you, you need to get to know that boy, you know, like I could see happening in my house. And so uh, the father invited the fiancé into the, another room in the house just to talk, and he's, the father says, so what are your plans? And the father, I mean, the young man responded, well, I'm going to be a biblical scholar. And the, you know, the, the dad, oh, this is great, awesome, biblical scholar, okay, admirable. But what will you do to provide a nice house for my daughter to live in? I will study, the young man replied, and God will provide for us. And how will you buy her a beautiful engagement ring like she deserves to have? And the young man said, well, I will concentrate on my studies and God will provide for us. And children, asked the father, he's getting ever so much more apprehensive. And children, how will you support the children? Don't worry, sir, God will provide, replied the fiancé. And the conversation proceeded like that, and each time the father would question, the young idealist would insist that God will provide. And later the mother asked the father, said, well, how did it go talking to the fiancé? And the father, just with this grim look, he said, well, he has no job and no plans, and he thinks I'm God. <laughs> you see that... The, the thing that, that we need to know more than, more than repeating any kind of doctrinal system from verses 37 to 40, the thing that you need to know is it is, it is in the hands of God. It's all His work. <laughs> it, it is. He's, it, listen, your salvation today is not dependent upon your performance for Him today. You need to hear that. Because you have grown up in an atmosphere that says, prove yourself, and then you'll be worthy. Listen, that's, not, that, that's why Jesus says you need to come with faith like a child. You've grown up with everybody looking at you and saying, you need to achieve. Jesus says you just need to receive. You don't need to be an achiever. You need to be a receiver. Jesus provides that kind of eternal security. And then finally, to believe in Jesus brings eternal life. Look at verse 49. The, the bread that the fathers ate in the wilderness, 
that manna they ate, they still died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. You see, death is coming for us all. Some sooner than others. And so I want to ask you, what's your hope for eternal life apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ where He is your treasure? What is your hope? You can't have one. You can't have one. Do you have doubts about where you've placed your faith? Maybe your testimony would mirror my testimony about when I was 10 years old, not really knowing about Jesus and having trusted in Him and experienced that transformation. If that's your testimony today, then I want to tell you, Jesus alone can bring eternal life. And guess what? He's going to continue to tell us. John chapter 10, verse 10, The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. In fact, in John chapter 14, He's going to tell us that He is the way, the truth, and the life. Remember, we're just supposed to come and believe and we will find spiritual satisfaction. And so what would your life say about where you are looking for fulfillment? You get what you get and you don't pitch a fit in the Johnson house, right? There was a little girl who, who looked at her dad and, and he was trying to make a similar argument. And he said, hey, you've got like six green beans left on your plate. You ate all your meat. You did a great job. You, you, you need to do that. She said, I'm full. He said, no, you got six green beans. She said, I, I want some dessert. And maybe that's happened in your house, right? That's happened in my house. And I'm like, well, I, wait a second. I, you know, I try to appeal to my kids on a logical basis, <laughs> right? Um, right? <laughs> Especially when they're like two and three. Ryan, that doesn't, Mandy's like, Ryan, they don't get that, you know? And so, but I'm like, if you've got room for cake, let's just say, then you got room for the six green beans. And so this father tried to make this argument with this little girl, and the little girl stood up in her chair and she said, this is my meat stomach, this is my vegetable stomach, and this is my dessert stomach. These are full. Give me cake, right? <laughs> Just in a very cute way, right? I asked you earlier in today, in, in this service, I said, what do you want? And I, I, that was the picture for that. And I pointed you to this quote by C.S. Lewis. If today you've recognized that you have a desire within you, that nothing else on this earth, nothing else on this earth can fill. And you've never put your faith and your trust in Jesus. Then my friend, today is the day that Jesus has brought you here so that you can put your faith and your trust in Jesus. If you've experienced the stir of His Spirit, then do not harden your hearts. If he, is, if he is calling you today to be in a relationship with Him, it doesn't matter what, what your reputation is in this community. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter how long you've been a member of this church. Let me tell you, today, don't, don't, let, don't let it go. This time of invitation that we're about to begin is a time for you to respond. And maybe you are a believer. Maybe, maybe you are believing in Jesus and you are, you are walking with Him and you know Him. Then today is a day for you to worship Him for the eternal security that He has brought you. For the satisfaction that He has brought you. Or maybe you're a believer and you've struggled with sin. And you, you've drifted into a season of your life like all of us do from time to time. Where you've been trying to put other things into that God-shaped hole. And today is a day for you to worship Jesus and repent. And just say, I, you know what? You're right. <laughs> Nothing else can fill it because I've tried. Nothing else can fill it. Everything else is going to burn. All the money's going to be in somebody else's pocket. All the cars are going to break down. All the phones are going to go obsolete one day. All of the accolades are going to be in a landfill one day. I want the thing that will last, and that is Jesus. And Jesus, you are my treasure. Maybe that needs to be your, your heart cry today. Or maybe you're just struggling and you're saying, you know what, I, I just feel like I'm in that dryness and I, need to, I, I just need you to pray for me, Ryan. I need you to encourage me. Now's the time. Now's the time for you to do something with Jesus. And whatever that something is, now's the time for you to do it. We're going to sing a very familiar hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I love this hymn and I chose this hymn because of this reality. If you want to come to Him, you don't have to walk an aisle. If you want to believe in Him, it's something you can do right there where you are. Just turn your eyes upon the truths that we've talked about. Look full 
and His wonderful face. And the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. You know what that means? That means you can testify, I've looked for satisfaction in other places. It can't be found. Jesus, you alone satisfy. And I want you in my life. Maybe I want more of you today. Let that be your heart cry. Let's pray together.